Terry. It's, um, it's a rather long story about how I became interested in the Osage. But basically, I think what my interest has been in the Osage is the same that um, what actually answered for a lot of a lot of groups in Oklahoma. The, the Osage, although at times people think a lot has been written about the Osage, there hasn't been that much. Um, there are a lot of parts of Osage culture that have not been examined from a historical viewpoint. And I wanted to see exactly what what had happened to one particular people. The, re the reason I think why I chose the Osage was because I knew some Osages when I was in college and uh, I really liked them as individuals. And to me, the, the Osages are one of the more fascinating uh, tribes in, in North America. You know, the Osage, and this is a fact that most people don't know about the Osage, the Osage, about 1800, were the most powerful and influential tribe west of the Mississippi River. And the Osages had an effect on American history that most people don't know about. Uh, the, the Osages um, acted as a central point for trade. You know, the, the Osages named most of the tribes west of the Mississippi. They were the key tribe. The, the, the traders came to the Osage and from the Osage, and through the Osage, contact was made with the other tribes in, in the west, to the west of them. The, uh, traders coming up the Missouri River would first come in contact with the Osage, and then from that point, then they would have contact with these more western tribes. So that in American history, the Osage occupy a very, very important position, and understand history of the entire Central Plains area, you have to know the Osage because they say they're, they're the key to it. And so when I when I started looking at what I would, from a historical standpoint about tribes to, to, that needed to have research done on them and tribes that were of extreme importance, the Osage stood out. There was no doubt they they were one of the most you know important tribes. And so I undertook I undertook it for that purpose because. Uh, you have to understand them to understand the history of this entire area. Okay. Larry? Uh, just about how large were the tribes? <coughs> well, the Osage, when the French first came into contact with the Osage, probably numbered around 6,500 to 7,000. And they held this number throughout most of the early history. It's during the 19th century after you get the removal of the five uh, five civilized tribes in the southeast and they're placed in what was the Osage area because where these tribes are located today, where the five civilized tribes are located today, that did belong to the Osage before the removal of these tribes. And as these tribes came out and came into conflict with the Osage, I think probably most people heard about Claremore's Mound, the Battle of Claremore's Mound between the uh, Cherokee and the Osage, there were two battles uh, that were fought there. And um, before that, um, they say they numbered about 6,500 to 7,000. After that, then the, their numbers start to decline rather rapidly until the time they were removed from Kansas in 1872 and brought back into Oklahoma. At that time, there were about 3,200 Osages, 32, 3,300. Okay. Where is the original home of the Osage? Well, originally, once again, going back to the time the French first came into uh, uh, into the uh, Mississippi Valley, the Osages were located along the Osage River in Missouri, and it was a rather small area. The, the Osage occupied just so, uh, southwestern and south central Missouri. After European contact, then the Osage start to expand their territory. And uh, they do this by driving out other tribes. They drove out the Pawnee and other tribes out of central Oklahoma. Do uh, you finally get a point where all of eastern Oklahoma, most of Arkansas, half of Missouri, and uh, much of southeastern Kansas was the area occupied by the Osage. So you, you get a, a, a real drastic change after European contact. 
Miami. When did the Osages move to Oklahoma and why did well, actually, the Osage were in Oklahoma originally. It's, it's one of those strange things that happens in history. Um, um, as I said, you know, after they had driven the, the Pawnee out of Oklahoma, then you had some Osage villages actually in Oklahoma, like Claremore's Village, which was founded in 1802 by some Osages moving from Missouri down to what they call the Three Forks area. And Starting in 1808, there was the first treaty with the Osage, and the first treaty uh, took a, uh, in the first treaty, the Osage um, surrendered in part most of their lands in Missouri and Arkansas. Then there was another treaty in 1818, which they, uh, uh, they agreed to give up part of the lands in Oklahoma and Arkansas. And finally, the treaty of 1825 was signed, and with the treaty of 1825, um, the Osage were reduced to a reservation in Kansas, just following the southern border of Kansas, uh, as far as the U.S. territory went. 1825, you have to remember Texas and that area belongs to Mexico. That's part of the Republic of Mexico at that point. So it actually went from eastern Kansas all the way across southern Kansas into, um, well, to the U.S. border with Mexico. And uh, not all the Osage agreed to that treaty, by the way. Claremore's Valley didn't agree to the treaty. And so Claremore and Black Dog and a few of the other Osage leaders in Oklahoma uh, remained in Oklahoma in spite of the fact that this area had been given to the Cherokee and the Cherokee were moving in. And um, it's not until 1839 that the Osage move, or Claremore's Village and Black Dog's Village, move from Oklahoma to southern Kansas on the Osage Reservation in southern Kansas. So they were here originally. Then in 1872, the Osage moved back or moved back to Oklahoma. The government decided they didn't want them in Kansas any longer. <laughs> so they decided to move them back to Oklahoma. And in this they purchase present day Osage County from the Cherokees. So they buy back from the Cherokees the land that the the government had uh, forced them to give up in 1825. So really, the, the Osage are an Oklahoma tribe, but they were just moved out of the state and then moved back into the state. And the area that, that Osage County today is, it is, an, it is part of the uh, earlier Osage lands. How did you go about finding out all your information and facts on your study? <laughs> well, that's, that's rather difficult. Um, most of the material I used in my study and, and the part that's been published was from historical documents. And uh, to, to do that study, there are approximately 250 written or published books and articles covered in the study and probably close to 50,000 pages of documents that I had to go through. And um, even still, even uh, when you, when you get into to reading some of the early books, particularly early explorers' accounts, uh, there's not that much on the Osage. When I say there are 200, 250 sources there, not all of them are entirely on the Osage. Sometimes you'll read a book, an early book, and you'll find one fact out about the Osage. There's one thing in the entire book that will refer to them. Um, so that it's, uh, it, it, you had to piece it together out of a lot of, a lot of different sources. And you have to remember, and this is one of the, the hardest things in, in trying to do this type of research, when you're working with documents like this. You're working with documents at times of people who didn't like the Osage. Uh, in fact, more things are said about uh, people by their enemies than anybody else. A, a lot of the information is by people who didn't like the Osage uh, or written by people who were looking at the Osage in a very um, biased manner. A lot, of, a lot of missionary reports. And the missionaries, the missionaries are prejudiced. I mean, they, if they didn't have a very strong opinion about something, they wouldn't be a missionary to begin with. And so a lot of the things are written by people who, who were anything but positive as far as the Osage were concerned. And you have to remember this. You have to take this into consideration every time you're reading something. You're, you're reading something written by a person who, who at best, 
has only a slight understanding of what they're writing about, and at times are extremely hostile to the people they're writing about. Um, so you have to cut out all that prejudice and bias that's found in those documents. And there's a lot of prejudice and bias in those documents. Um, I think some people would be horrified if they'd read a few of them and what people were saying. But then there are, there are the other side. There are some of the people who write about the Osage who are very, very pro-Osage in this. One of the interesting things about the later period is that most of the, uh, much of the material on the Osage comes from Cherokee sources. The Cherokees, particularly when the Cherokees were moved out here and were in conflict with the Osage, the Cherokees had a lot to say about the Osage. Those are some of the more prejudiced articles and <laughs> information about the age that comes out of the Cherokee documents. Uh, what did they think about the white settlers? Well, the Osage, see, the, the, the Osage are different from most tribes in, in that the, the Osage had contact with the French traders early, very early contact with them. There's a lot of hostility between the Osage and the French. Um, people don't people don't realize this, uh, but the French and the the French and the Indians did not get along quite as well as people say the French and the Indians got along. Um, the Osage were well aware of the fact that the the French were there to to trade and they were getting a good deal out of the Osage. Where, as long as the French came to trade and would leave. The Osage, didn't, uh, the Osage got along with them fairly well because the French had things they wanted. They wanted guns. They, the Osage wanted, wanted uh, steel knives, steel axes, uh, copper buckets. In other words, things a European manufacture. And as long as they could get these, they knew they had to get these from the French, and they got along with the French pretty well. Um, it's when French trappers start coming in. You know, the difference between a trader and a trapper, uh, starting in the, the 1700s, late 1700s, a lot of French trappers, individual trappers, start coming in to uh, into these areas owned by the Osage. And uh, when these trappers start coming in, the Osage start getting a little upset with the French because now they're, you know, now they're encroaching on them. And there was a, there was kind of an informal war that was between the Osage had with the French in the 1780s and 1790s. Um, Finally, it became so bad that the, the Osage actually attacked the French settlement at, at St. Genevieve, uh, which is in Missouri, along the, along the Mississippi River. And the first attack, they didn't kill anyone. They just went in and ran off their horses and um, made a lot of noise and just kind of frightened people. And people in St. Genevieve immediately, this is, a, this is when Louisiana is Spanish, because in uh, 1763, Louisiana was, the French gave it to the Spanish. And um, although the, the people in Louisiana are still French, they're not, they're not very many Spanish people come into Louisiana, just the governor and soldiers and things like that. The, the, uh, the, the people in St. Genevieve immediately petitioned the Spanish governor to declare war on the Osage. So he declared war on the Osage. He said the Osage were the biggest nuisance to his government in Louisiana. And he decided to, to do away with them. But he never did anything except declare war and make a few hostile acts. He cut off trade to the Osage. And so the Osage became a little irritated with this. And they raided St. Genevieve again, and they killed a man in the second raid. And immediately the citizens of St. Genevieve petitioned the governor to make peace with the Osage. After the second raid, the person's actually dead. And uh, so the Spanish uh, made an agreement by, with, with a trader named uh, Choto, who uh, established a trading post among the Osage, and um, the, the purpose of this was to, to, to reestablish trade and to put somebody in charge of trying to control the Osage. And this is what uh, this trader Shoto's responsibility was. And so there weren't any other problems, between, major problems between the, the Spanish in Louisiana and, and the Osage at that time. Later, there there's really not an opportunity. There's no, there's no direct contact with white settlement until the, well, until the, starting, I guess, around the 1850s and 1860s. What happens is the eastern tribes move in. The five civilized tribes are moved in. 
And then you get other tribes that are moved into Kansas. And actually, the Osage is surrounded by other tribes from the East, the Delaware, Sac and Fox, Iowa's, Kickapoos. All these people are placed kind of around the Osage. And then in the 1850s, you start getting some conflict with the whites in Kansas. The whites in Kansas want the Indians removed from Kansas. And eventually, this is why the Osage are removed from Kansas, along with all the other tribes. Because, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, when, when Kansas, if you go back in, in U.S. history, there was going to be the permanent Indian frontier. You know, they chose the, uh, the Great Plains was, at, was thought by the U.S. government to be a place unfit for human habitation. Therefore, they thought, well, that's an ideal place for the Indians because no one could live in that area. They didn't think anyone could live in that area. So they created what was known as a permanent Indian frontier, which is basically the present-day eastern Oklahoma and eastern Kansas boundary. And the five civilized tribes were put into what's now Oklahoma, and then Kansas was a whole series of reservations as well. But what happens is you, you get white settlement coming into Kansas, and they decide, well, the area of Kansas is pretty good for white settlement, so let's move them off further south into Oklahoma. So you get the removal of those groups south, uh, south into Oklahoma. But so that in the, the early period, uh, the, the Osage in the 1850s, starting or in the 1830s, 40s, and so forth, they're buffered by these other tribes and these other reservations in Kansas. Uh, as those people are moved out of Kansas, then the Osage start having problems with white squatters on the reservation. White squatters, white horse thieves, uh, people coming in, cutting down the walnut trees. Even in that period, walnut trees were valuable. They'd come on and steal them. And um, it became a rather awkward situation. The, the Osage, unfortunately, militarily, they were, uh, their power was already broken by this time. It had been broken by the, in their battles with the Eastern tribes, particularly with the Cherokee. And so, therefore, they didn't try to they couldn't really physically resist this encroachment. Uh, there's a whole series of lawsuits and trials and uh, attempts by the Osage to get these squatters off their reservation. Um, but the, the squatters had a tendency to remain. Occasionally, the Osage would get upset and burn out some squatters. But then occasionally, when the Osage were out hunting buffalo, the squatters would come back and burn down one of their villages, too. So it was... It was uh, while it wasn't a peaceful situation, there wasn't any real outright warfare. Occasionally a person was killed on either side, but there was no real fighting. So the Osage really didn't have any, unlike most of the other tribes, there was, there's never an, a, a war between the Osage and the Americans. And really the, the war between the Osage and the, you know, in, in Spanish Louisiana really wasn't much of a war. It was, um, uh, the, the, the wars, if you want to talk about the, the wars with the Osage, it's the wars with the Eastern tribes that are being removed. That's the real wars they're involved in. That's where you have the real battles. Not with the, and not with the whites. What type of economy did they have? Well, originally, the Osage, and we're going back to the, the period before before the Europeans come into, into the Mississippi Valley. At that time, the Osage were farmers and hunters. Um, they, they farmed, they had small fields along the, along the rivers and raised corn and beans and squash. And this was done primarily by the women. Uh, they did some hunting. Um, hunting of some they did some hunting of buffalo, but they didn't have horses, so they couldn't really have large buffalo hunts. There were some buff there's some hunting of buffalo, some hunting of elk, some hunting of deer. And before the horse came to the Osage, the principal method of hunting large animals like that was with fire drives. And what they'd do is that um, they, they'd, there'd be a herd of animals in a in a prairie area, and they'd set the prairie on fire on one end, hoping the wind was blowing the fire toward the animals, and then try to drive the animals into an area along the river, and the hunters would be along the river, and as the animals would, in the trees and undergrowth uh, along the river, and as the animals would run into there, the, so there'd be hunters in that area, and they'd sh shoot the animals as they came through. Later, um, 
after 1700, when the Osage get the horse, then they start going out west and hunting buffalo in large numbers. Um, and as they start hunting buffalo, then the other things become unimportant because uh, the hunting of buffalo would supply them with enough food. And they, they had two hunts a year, one in the summer and, and one in the fall. And these two hunts a year would supply the Osage with so much meat that they could well, it lessened their dependence upon hunting of other things, lessened the, the, their dependence upon the hunting of elk and deer and other animals. It also lessened their dependence upon farming. So you get smaller farms and more and more of a dependence upon on hunting. But that's only one aspect of the economy. As the Europeans come in, they also become involved in trade, in the fur trade. The Osage were the major source of furs for the French in, in, uh, and later the Spanish in Louisiana. Uh, the Osage uh, trapped beaver, they trapped otter. Uh, beaver and otter uh, and smaller animals being the primary, uh, primary trade item for the Europeans. Later in the 19, uh, 1800s, during the 19th century, the Osage became involved in the buffalo robe trade. And the Osage really didn't well, the Osage hunted some buffalo. You know, it's a long way from a, a, a buffalo hide to a buffalo robe because it takes a lot of work that was involved in it. And the Os what the Osage would In the 1840s and 1850s, the, o the Osage became involved in the robe trade. And um, they produced some of the robes themselves, but primarily what the Osage would do is they would uh, take European guns and munitions and steel weapons and all, and they would trade these to the Comanche uh, for robes. And the Osage developed uh, themselves as a middle middleman in this this type of trade, and they became actually very very wealthy from this trade with the Comanche. Uh, they they did not just they traded for more than just robes. They also traded from, with for uh, for horses, and very early they learned how to use credit. They'd go to traders, and the government was paying them some annuities, and they'd take these annuities out on credit with the traders to get all these things, take it out and trade these to the Comanches. And uh, they'd trade uh, these things to the Comanches for fabulous prices. And then they would come back in with these, uh, these horses and these robes, and one year alone they brought back over $60,000 in horses. And this is, that's a lot of money in the 1840s. And, um, then they would either use their payment from the government for their uh, 1825 treaty to pay off the traders, or they'd trade them some of their horses and some of the, uh, some of the robes to pay off these things that they'd gotten on credit. Um, later, after the Civil War, then you start getting into the trade in buffalo hides, just the raw hides itself. Uh, buffalo hides became important in trade because Buffalo hide made pulley belts for factories. We don't, you know, you, you think about, you, know, you see pictures of these huge piles of buffalo hides, just these raw, you know, green hides laying on some freight dock in Kansas, something, something, and people rarely ask, well, what would, what were the people in New York City going to do with all these raw buffalo hides? Well, what they were doing is they were turning them into pulley belts to use in factories, and I guess. I don't know what they did after the buffalo hides ran out, but that's what happened to the buffalo. They were all slaughtered for pulley belts. But the, you know, the Osages were involved in that trade as, as, as well. Um, I think it's something, I think the thing that we have to remember, I think that people forget, is they think about the Osage being rich because of oil. The Osage were a very wealthy tribe long before oil was ever discovered on the reservation. They were, just, they were wealthy, after they moved down from Oklahoma because of the sale of their Kansas lands. The, the lands in Kansas were actually sold to white settlers after they moved down. They had that, the, the Osage had that money. They had tremendous land holdings in Osage County uh, or on the Osage Reservation. So in the 1880s, people were talking about them being the wealthiest people in, in the world. And this is before oil was ever discovered. And you go back even earlier 
they talked about the Osage, how wealthy the Osage were in the 1850s with the hide trade. And you go back before that, and the French and Spanish are talking about the wealthy Osage because of the fur trade before that. So the Osage have always been an extremely wealthy tribe, by even by European standards, as wealthy or wealthier than the average European that they came in contact with. And as I say, people usually think of the Osage in just the oil, but it's been something that has been present throughout Osage history. Uh, did they ever uh, have any... Uh, any of the tribes have anything in common with the Osages? Um, the, the groups that were closest to the Osages were uh, some of the other Siouan peoples, like the, the Kansa or the Kaw, as they're more commonly known. And um, the, the Kaw and the Osage intermarry a great deal. In fact, at times it becomes rather blurred as to who's a Kaw and who's an Osage because there was so much contact between the two. Generally, the, the Osage, the, the Osage did not get along terribly well with a lot of the surrounding tribes. Uh, uh, the Kaws were the, the, their, their closest friends. They got along with some of the other uh, um, other Siouan-speaking tribes, but for the most part, the, the Osage had fairly hostile relationships. The Osage were an aggressive tribe. I think this is what you have to remember about them. Uh, they're, they're an aggressive tribe, they're, they're powerful, uh, they're expanding their territory. And as they expanded it, they didn't expand it at the expense of the call. And so the call and the Osage always got along well enough that, uh, in fact, the call and the Osage would hunt together at times and would, were constantly, there was constant contact between them. But the other people, the Osage felt like, um, well, the other people had territories that were rich in furs and the Osage wanted them, the Osage took them. And it was, some of that hostility went on for for a hundred years, 150 years. And then when the Eastern tribes came out and were moved out, the Osage were defending their land against those, so they didn't get along too well with them either. So that the, the Osage didn't have very many friends. <laughs> How did they set up the allotments of land and the head rights and Divide, divide everything they had. Well, you know, the, the Osage are unique in, the, in, in what happened. Um, the Osage, first of all, resisted a lot. The, the, Osage, the Osage held out, and in part it got to the point where I think the government was willing to, to go to almost any lengths to try to allot the Osage reservation. They, the, you remember this doesn't happen until right about the same time as statehood. You know, the other reservations, they are, their areas have been allotted, or they're in the process of being allotted, so that they're destroying the Indian reservation system in Oklahoma. So the Osage came out with a very unique agreement, part of, partially due to the fact that they actually purchased the reservation from the Cherokee. They paid money for this. There was a deed to the reservation. They did indeed own that land, uh, recognized by the whites as owning that land. Um, all the tribes owned their land, really. But the, at least as far as the white government was concerned in this case, they, they actually owned this. It was not like a reservation that had been assigned to them by the government, like you get with the more Western tribes. Also, oil had been found on the reservation before a lot. So people knew that there was potentially a lot of wealth on the reservation. So these two things operated together. So that the, the reservation, instead of like, instead of situations like you, you got among the other tribes so frequently where they'd give say 160 acres of land or 80 acres of land to every head of the household and a smaller amount to uh, dependents within the household. The Osage reservation was totally allotted. Now this is unusual in itself. Once again, getting back to the idea the Osage owned it. Uh, so therefore all of the land belonged to them and they, the government agreed to a total allotment of the reservation. Oh, certain areas were, were reserved. There were um, schools and the agency had some land reserved from it. But you can say virtually all the reservation with a few, few acres here and there. 
was assigned or allotted to individual Osages. And every man, woman, and child who was allotted received the very same amount. That's different also. But the, the real problem was what to do with the mineral wealth and how to handle that. So there have been a lot of stories, and I, I'm, not, I'm not certain exactly how they came up with the head right system. But the head right system is unique. Uh, no other tribe has, has ever had such a system uh, developed. And, as, you know, the head, the head right system, where every allottee received a head right, just like a sheriff's stock. And the tribe itself retained all the mineral rights. But that, that's a very, very unique system. Um, as I say, I don't know. I've heard stories about how it developed and why, but I'm not certain myself. I've never seen the records of what went on. In fact, it'd be very interesting to see who really came up with this idea. Because I say it's so, so unusual an idea for, uh, for the distribution of, of mineral rights. What are some of the tribal ceremonies? <clears throat> well, you know, Osage tribal ceremonies have changed a lot. Uh, the, the ceremonies that the Osage have today are not the traditional Osage ceremonies. What happened, or at least this is what I think happened, uh, let's put it per make it perfectly clear. The, o the Osage ceremonial, uh, Osage ceremonies, the traditional ones, the tribal ones that they had, say, in the you know, 1700s and 1800s, were based upon a clan system. And the Osage had 24 clans. And with these ceremonies, every clan had a very specific role to play within that ceremony. So he, he, every ceremony had 24 parts to it. And this meant it was a very complex ceremony that, that, that they had. Uh, and to perform the, tri uh, the clans part of that ceremony, they had people who were called little old men. And these little old men were people who were trained. Uh, little old men were old, or older individuals, because it took, uh, this is something a man would work for throughout his life, is to become one of these. He was a, he was a religious leader. He was a clan leader. He knew that his clan's part in that particular ceremony. And so to have a ceremony, you had to bring together 24 of these little old men. You'd bring them together, and each of them would perform their clan's part of that ceremony. Well, what happened was that after the removal from Kansas, um, when the Osage moved from Kansas to Oklahoma in 1872, there were approximately 3,200 full-blood Osages left. And due to disease and other factors, and, I, and I'm, not, I'm not certain exactly how you would describe the other factors. In anthropology, we call it culture shock. There was just a, a decline in the will to, to live. I mean, things had changed drastically for the Osage. Suddenly they were placed on this small reservation. Uh, there was a lot of trouble with the government as far as the Osage rights were concerned. The government was really trying to control the tribe. The agents were trying to, and at different times, showed that the, that the Osage were no longer independent from the government. They were actually controlled by the government. There was even some starvation during this period uh, due to, to government policies. But anyone, uh, and I say, I don't know what all the, what caused it, because a lot of the causes are psychological causes. But the Osage population dropped from about 3,200 full bloods down to about 900 full bloods in 15 years. In other words, the Osage was dying off. The Osage reservation turns into, well, it's, um, it's a dead house almost. I mean, the population is just drastically declining. And as a result of this, or I think as a result of this, that certain clans became extinct. And when these clans became extinct, then these ceremonies could no longer be performed because that, that part of the ceremony was gone. So what happens is that the, the, the Osage cere the tribal ceremonies cease to function 
because they no longer can find the people to carry them out. And what happened was that, that in its place, the, the Ilonshka dance developed. The Ilonshka dance came in, and it varies from community to community, but it came in around 1883-1884. It's a dance that's, that was given to the Osage by the, the, the Paw and the Ponca. I think the Pawhuska drum and the Hominy drum were, were given by the Paws, and the Gray Horse or Fairfax drum was given to him by the Ponca. And this dance becomes the principal Osage ceremony and, and remains such until today. But it is not one of the traditional, traditional tribal ceremonies. So it's a late one that comes in. Uh, how important is the peyote religion to the Osage? Well, and to understand the history of the Osage, the peyote religion is, is very important. Because at the same time, these ceremonies are, are dying out, or are, are, are cease, at the same time the Osage cease to perform these ceremonies, then peyote comes in. And peyote, as I see it, has tremi a tremendous impact on the Osage. Uh, because I involved in, in the peyote religion is a, an acceptance of an entirely new way of life and a rejection of what has happened before. This is why, uh, and um, it, it seems to appear in, in what a lot of older Osages have told me at times that that when the Osage become peyotists, they really do give up that traditional way. They, they left it behind, and they took this as something new and the, and the new way of life. And this is, this is why there seems to be so little known about what happened in the past, forest stories and um, concepts of the clan and clans and ceremonies and all that went on before because it changed. The Osage people have always been very pragmatic. They're practical people. When something doesn't work, you take something that does work. They saw in the 1880s and 1890s the old, the old traditional religion and ceremonies weren't working. They couldn't perform them. So the Osage, being practical, found something that would work, and this was peyote. And so as I say, it pre-tied a real drastic change in Osage life as they take up an entirely new way of life that's involved with, with the peyote religion. Uh, when did the uh, Osages come into Oklahoma? <laughs> they came in, um, in 1872. And there's a lot of interesting stories concerning the coming to, to Oklahoma and the choice of, of, of Osage County, present day Osage County as their reservation. Um, one of the reasons why they chose that area, there were some people who wanted to go further west. And, um, you know, Osage County is located in what was known as the Cherokee Outlet that extended, well, all the way from present day eastern Osage County boundary out to the Panhandle. It didn't include the Panhandle, but out to the Panhandle. And that area was open for the Osage. And they could have taken any place along that that outlet because there, there were no other tribes in that outlet at that time. Later the Ponca and the, and the Pawnee and the Oto, Missouri and, uh, are moved into the outlet as well. But the reason they, they chose Osage County, according to the stories, was that, that they saw it was a, a hilly, rocky area. And they saw the white farmers like flat. Uh, areas with soil instead of rocks. And so one of the reasons for choosing that area was because they thought that at least there the whites would finally leave them alone. They were wrong, of course. <laughs> but at least they thought that by, move, by moving into this rocky area where they where you couldn't farm, the whites would leave them alone. How was the tribal government structured? In the, in the past, it was structured uh, on a hereditary basis. The Osage actually had two chiefs. Um, this is a very common feature among uh, tribes in the eastern United States, is to have, they actually have two chiefs. And they had a, a Siju and a Honka chief. And um, the two chiefs had about the same power. Every village had 
but it had two chiefs. And there were five villages originally. Uh, these chiefs were actually, these were hereditary positions. They were hereditary within a clan and a family within that clan. It wasn't like European kings in the sense that it didn't go from father to son necessarily. It went from one man who's a member of that family to another individual who was a member of that family. And what the had was a chief had, each of the two chiefs had five Akidas, which roughly translates soldier in English. They call them five soldiers. Uh, and these five Akida were selected, and they say each chief had five, five Akidas. And these men were the people who enforced the chief's orders. When they were on a buffalo hunt or whatever they were doing, he would enforce the orders of the chief, or the, the five of them would enforce his orders. And when a chief died, these five men acting in council would choose the next chief from the members of that family. It usually went to the son, and usually to the man's eldest son, but it didn't have to go that way. And this is the system that continued up until the 18, well, the late 1860s. Is there anything unique today about our back then about the old sage culture that's not found in any of the other tribes? It's not that, that Osage culture is that unique as such. It's very similar to the Kaw, to Ponca, to Omaha, to Quapaw. Uh, but with the Osage, everything was more complex. The other, well, the Osage had 24 clans. The others usually had seven, eight, nine, ten. They had fewer clans. They were not as structured as the Osage. The Osage were, were extremely structured. Everybody had their place in Osage society. Every it was um, it was the most highly structured of the of the Western tribes as far as their 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 clan structure because there were clans, there were sub clans, there were families within those clans, all with their own names, and uh, the clans were divided into uh, we call them the Earth and Sky people, Siju and Hunka people, and um, so it's not, it's not that it's unique in its overall pattern, but it's unique in the degree that the Osage took it. That's, that's where the uniqueness 